Welcome back to another installment of this training series on marketing for deals. And in this video, we're going to talk about the top 10 methods of paid marketing. Now that you've closed some deals and made some money off of those free methods of marketing that we talked about in the previous installment, which you can see right here if you haven't seen it already. So definitely stay tuned. We're going to go through the top 10 methods of paid marketing that we leverage in our business and you should be leveraging in your business to make real estate investing easy. And oh, look what time it is. It's, it's time, time to, to make, make it easy. easy. Hey everybody, just like Chris said, we're gonna get into the top 10 marketing methods. Feel free to use the chapter markers to skip ahead to which one you wanna learn more about. And with that, the order we're going in is from the usually the most cost effective one is going to be last. So the most expensive ones first to actually what we found to be the lowest cost per lead that we've ever seen and that our done for you marketing clients have ever seen. And we'll get to that at the end. You're not going to want to miss that. So stick around for the first one though. Let's talk about what we have on the agenda. What is the first marketing method that we're going to talk about today, Mr. Chris? Yeah, thanks Christian. So this marketing method is really for the more sophisticated investors who have kind of built up a war chest of capital that they're ready to deploy in some different methods of marketing and it's more of a branding method of marketing get your name out there in the public eye a little bit more direct and this is going to be television ads so it's quite a bit more spendy requires a little bit of production time and you're going to want to follow a very strategic process when it comes to putting out uh, television ads which i'm sure you could speak more to yeah as far as the process for putting these ads on tv we actually have a video that's going to be going into a little bit more depth linked in the description below so if you are an investor that's pretty seasoned or you're an investor that maybe you've gotten started recently but you've closed some killer deals then and you're thinking man i want the lead flow to continue some of our clients have done this before and they've come to us and we fulfilled on their marketing and they've been surprised by the results that they get from what we're doing but if you're doing this independently one person comes to mind who did this in illinois they followed a strategic system which none of this stuff anybody really invented it's all just swipe it's repeated regurgitated and packaged you stole it not exactly you stole no, my I car my life I I know you stole it. but we do go into great depth explaining how to get into that what the costs are and really what you should consider in your own budget and how to approach that another kind of subtle pivot from television ads would be youtube ads so I know that's something that a lot of people are kind of diving into. It's kind of similar to television ads, but it's going to be a little bit more targeted to a specific audience. Whereas like TV ads, it's just broad how many viewers are on the channel that you're trying to get on. Right. Uh, and so depends on the channel you're getting on, right? Could have a lot of viewers, not many viewers, the time of day. So there's a lot of challenges there. Whereas YouTube ads are going to be, they're, they're similar to TV in the, the media form but you're able to target specific audience segments based on what type of videos that they watch. So you might be able to, you know, get a little bit better results. Yeah, you know what? I'm actually really glad you brought that up because that is something that we do YouTube ads and we have done. And I can tell you, if you do it wrong, you are liable to be able to spend a lot of money without a good result. Well, that didn't work. The best way in which to leverage YouTube ads for your real estate investment business is to be an authority in the market that you're in when you're on YouTube as just content that is for free. And what I mean by that is if you've ever searched like a day in the life of or, you know, living in San Diego, California, whatever pops up at the top of that list, that person is probably like monetizing off of that. And if it's not the first video that comes up, at least the second or the third video, like say Houston, Texas, living in Houston, Texas, I can almost guarantee you they are real estate investors and they're giving you a tour of the city. Why? Because they have inventory when they're turning through properties, they want to sell those properties. They're looking for not only other investors, but also retail buyers. So as real estate agents, that is a massive way to grow a following and become an authority in your local business for real estate investors and for real estate agents. So keep that in mind. That's a really good point. Every once in a while, I have a good idea. Moments of clarity is what I call them. <laughs> so I was like, man, you're really smart. Yeah, and no, I just have moments of clarity. 
every once in a while. I get these ideas, I get so many ideas burning through my skull. The next one is, isn't it tangentially related as well? Yeah, the next one is gonna be radio ads. And so radio ads is gonna have similar type of an impact as television ads where it's not strategically targeted unless you're getting a lot of research and data on the audience that listens to a specific channel you might be able to really target in fairly well but generally speaking it's all, all broad based right so tv and radio are going to fall into that same category where you're really dependent on the viewers or the listeners of that specific channel during that specific time when your ad is going to run so it's not the most targeted but it's great for branding it's great for name recognition and you know for the most part as far as like different media radio ads can be pretty inexpensive depending on who you're going through what type of level of production you're putting into them and you know what time of day and what channels that you're actually getting on yeah speaking to radio ads I used to work for clear channel communications and they had AM and FM radio and what I found was a lot of real estate investors and, and even real estate agents again just like TV ads or YouTube ads we're advertising on the AM stations. Hmm. And I figured, hey, there's something to that, and it turns out there is. It's because most of the viewers, you, you can look at any channel, you can even go online about that particular channel. Like I worked for a channel called 933 in promotions, and I worked for a country station and a couple other ones. I didn't work for the AM stations, mm -hmm. but it was all owned by Clear Channel. There's, you know, SK Telecom and Jefferson Pilot Communications in San Diego. But the AM stations were the ones that they all advertised. And how to do that, by the way, is to call the radio station, talk to their advertising department, and then just ask for a quote. Bigger metropolitan areas are obviously gonna cost you a whole lot more money to advertise, yep. and it also is dependent upon the time that you're gonna advertise. So these are big ticket items, but I don't know if you have an answer to this question, Chris. I do, I can tell you right now who I've heard on the radio time and time again, listen to like AM 760 or AM 600 in San Diego. It's like political talk radio and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm the demographic that's like, let me sell my house and they're advertising. And there's one name in San Diego that sticks out that I know has done really well to build, like you said, brand recognition. Anybody that you can think of that you've heard on the radio? He listens to Spotify, see, that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> he's in that demographic of, even though he might be older than that demographic, he's still relevant as far as the culture is concerned because he's cool. I'm so cool, you don't even know I'm cool. Me, on the other hand, apparently I moved to a, a really older community and I've just aged significantly. But Dan Beer. I was thinking Dan Beer. That's, see? I should have said Dan Beer because yes. that's what I was thinking. Well, see, because it works, dude. You probably don't listen to the radio very often, but even if you flip it on for a second, it's like Dan Beer, like the delicious drink. The reason I thought Dan Beer was just because he's everywhere else, right? And yeah. so, you know, for those of you who are watching, you know, Dan Beer does a great job of doing billboards. He's doing bus stop signs. He's doing radio ads. He's like all over the place. So in marketing, I mean, I have a background in sales and marketing and advertising. And generally speaking, across all different types of products that you're selling it typically takes anywhere from seven to nine sometimes even more points of contact for marketing methods to actually reach the buyers that they're trying to attract to get them to make a buying decision and so you know Dan has gotten to the level where he's actually doing that he's going to every single method of marketing so it doesn't matter whether you look left right up <laughs> down anywhere you're gonna see him another guy who's really good at that is not in the real estate space but he's an attorney is king attorney mm -hmm. king and his strategy and for those of you bigger investors this is something you should consider and, and i only know this because of my marketing background but there's what's called remnant advertising remnant advertising specifically when it comes to like billboards and bus stops and things like that it's basically all the leftover billboards and bus stops that haven't been sold through the beginning of the year and you can generally buy in bulk and get a substantial discount so there's an attorney back home in san diego where that's all he does is buys all of the remnant billboards and everything so you'll see five billboards all along the eight yeah. that are all the same you know call king call king call king call king i've never had to call king but i know if i ever need to call an attorney you for that particular call. thing i'm probably gonna call king nice what's next so the next one you know since we kind of pivoted from radio ads right into billboards that was the next one and then we also kind of layered in bus stops as well bus stops is another good one 
If you're looking for lead generation tools where you can scale that model and you can develop clear KPIs and metrics, these first ones are not really the ideal methods of marketing in order to do that. These are things where you're just gonna throw money at it and hopefully it works out. Hopefully it helps create a reputation for you in the, the community that you're already doing business. I would not get into investing and start with these methods yeah, of no, marketing. No. They're high ticket. And again, they're not directed marketing. They're more passive marketing and it's more brand recognition and name recognition totally. that you're trying to get. So you're going to spend a lot of money. You might not get any return at all, or you might not get any noticeable return. You know, it might influence some of your other paid methods of marketing or free methods of marketing yeah. that you're using just because they might see something else that is more targeted and be like, oh yeah, that's the guy that was on the billboard. Phil? Phil? Phil Connors? Phil Connors, I thought that was you. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for watching. Or, oh yeah, that's the guy that was at the bus stop. I That that name sounds familiar, or that company sounds familiar. And so yeah, so TV ads, radio ads, billboards, bus stops, all of those things, I would put those kind of like at the bottom of the list as far as prioritizing where you should be investing your money, especially if you're looking to scale a business. Right, so when you get started or even if you've been doing it for a while at some point these are going to be marketing methods you want to consider implementing it's only going to help establish your credibility in your local market and you know everybody knows this already but it's worth repeating real estate as far as markets are concerned it's all local it's yep. all local 100%. looking at national trends is helpful in certain senses but your market is your market and you know i know people from advertisements on YouTube ads in other markets, just because we're always doing this. We're always constantly looking to see what marketing methods are working better than others because, well, we have a done for you marketing business, but you're probably not, right? Yeah. Not nationally anyway, but we have a national audience. Nationally, investors are working with us to fulfill their marketing, so. Nationally. Nationally. Like, it's the difference between nuclear and nuclear. <laughs> I know which one's correct. Nuclear testing and proliferation. <laughs> it's nuclear. <laughs> nuclear. <laughs> anyway. Nice. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, the next ones we're going to dive into are these ones. You have a better ability to scale a business off of these ones. There's more direct and clear KPIs that you can measure and track and really identify the performance. Now, one thing I do want to touch on, as we said, you know, it's harder to develop KPIs and track and everything. Uh, it's not entirely true of the first four methods. If you're going to do any of those other methods, what I would highly encourage is getting specific phone numbers, tracking phone numbers or vanity phone mm -hmm. numbers that are tracked for all of those brand recognition type of ads. That way you can at least see when a phone call comes in, it'll identify what method of marketing that came from. If all of your methods of marketing are using the same phone number, there's no way for you to identify which method of marketing drove that person to call you. And now it's going to be very difficult for you to identify where you should be investing your money. You know right? what that's called? What's that? That's called a pro tip. Yes. That's a pro tip. And awesome. You're, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. So the next one is direct mail. Now direct mail, for those of you who have been in the business for a while, direct mail is tried and true. It's been around for a long, long time. It's probably not going anywhere anytime soon because, you know, as much as, you know, the methods of technology for phones, the methods of technology for where people are watching TV shows, how people are listening to radio stations, all these different things may change. But at the end of the day, ever since the foundation of societies, <laughs> like mail has always been there. Right. And so mail is something that is going to stick around. And, you know, obviously there's different ways to do it. You know, and, and Christian, you have more experience in direct mail than myself. So you could probably speak to it more. But I do know coming from an advertising background, generally speaking, anywhere from a one to three percent response rate. And this is across all different types of businesses 
is generally what you can expect. I would not expect anything higher than 3%. 3% would be phenomenal. Yeah. 1% is probably what you should bank on if you're doing it right. And doing it right typically requires multiple drops. It's very rare that you're gonna have, when I say drops, right, what do we mean? We mean to one person, like if I'm doing a direct mail piece to Christian, one mail piece today would be one drop. And then a week from now, that would be the second drop. And a week from then it would be the third drop, right? So if you're doing one drop, you're probably not gonna even get close to a 1% response rate. The general approach is typically gonna be four to five drops. Now, the challenge with that is that's where it increases the cost because you could be paying anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar depending on the type of direct mail piece that you're using, right? I mean, you've got postcards, why don't you show them some of the different things that you could do? Yeah, postcards, one, it could be something like this, you know, a little bit of a, a green postcard there. You know, it just sells your vacant home now. Obviously, this is targeted, which speaks to how you can get a higher response rate. You've got to be targeted in your marketing if you expect that. By the way, if if I got a 3%, a, a 3%, and I was 60 years old, or 70 years old, 80 years old, I'd be doing backflips. Oh. I don't know how I would do it, because <laughs> I can't do one. But I'd be doing backflips if I got that. And then, you know, it all depends on what you do. This one right here, it's got little, you know, color on it. It's very patriotic. But on the back, they told me to F off. They returned this in another envelope. So you're gonna get a lot of returns a lot of return to senders, which is this yellow piece right here. And that's one of the reasons it can get really expensive. But a couple things to note that are good tips and some pro tips. Melissadata.com is a good resource to check whether or not that address is either A, valid, B, occupied, or C, if the owner of the property lives there. You can do that for free to a certain extent. You could also have a subscription and What's more important than that is something that really fits in the center of this conversation, where you get your lists. Yeah. Where do you get your lists to make sure that you don't have stacks of these? And I've done it right and I've done it wrong. And I've had really big stacks return to me. Bad stacks, bad stacks. Because I didn't scrub the list properly. Yep. Of course I tried to scrub it, but what are a couple things that you use that we use together in our own business that are super beneficial as far as pulling the list well so i mean there's a number of different sources i mean you can use property radar you can use prop stream you can use privy just depends on what you're looking for but at the end of the day right like it is all about getting the right data if i'm sending out direct mail and i'm using a list that i pulled two years ago well chances are there's gonna be a lot of people on that list that have already moved, right? So it's really important that when you are doing direct mail pieces, you're working with fresh data, clean data, you're scrubbing out you know, bad data and just taking the time. But as far as like the different forms of direct mail, I mean, you've got handwritten letters, you've got postcards, you've got, you know, different flyers, you've got trifold flyers, yellow you've got, letters. you know, yellow letters. And then you also have like the old school hardcore method where you literally get your friends and family to help you hand write actual letters and fold them up and put them into envelopes and lick and stick. Yeah. And uh, what does that say right there? Hi, my name is Nathan. Who's Nathan? Nathan is my brother. Getting your friends and family. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, so I, I would not actually recommend, unless you are on a shoestring budget, which would be in our previous video about how to do lower cost, don't write it yourself unless you wanna get a cramp in your hand. I've found it's not really worth it, but what is worth it is writing this letter, and this is a photocopy. Yep. So then you can put hi, and then put a space for the name, and then a, then a comma and then print that out so then the only thing you're actually handwriting is the person's name. Exactly. That would be a little hack. Yep, yeah, and it 100%. works. It works, and they can tell, right? But psychologically, it's like, oh, you personally wrote this. Yep. I did personally write it. Yeah, To exactly. you and 3,000 other people. At initial glance, you know, they're gonna think it's handwritten to them, and, you know, and then all we're trying to do is get their eyes on it. 
yep. right? We just want we want to avoid that person that goes to the mailbox, flips through their mail, and we all do the same thing. I do it, right? What do you do? You pull out all the mail out of the mailbox, and you go trash, trash, bill, bills, 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 trash, trash, bill, trash, trash, bill. Oh, looks like it might be a check. And that's another yeah. good piece of direct mail that you can actually use at a really high level is there's some where it actually looks like a check. It's got the perforated edges that you would tear and unfold and it's got their offer right there on it. So that can be a really great form of direct mail yeah. because it's a pattern interrupt, right? At any time you're doing any type of advertising, you wanna think of a pattern interrupt and so knowing that everybody goes to the mailbox and they go trash trash bill bills 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 trash trash bill where do you think they're putting something that looks like a check definitely in their, not in the trash in their open box yes or they're keeping it with the bills and then sorting through the bills and open them. Maybe this one's going to pay off these other bills, Yeah, right. right? So yeah, think of a way you can interrupt patterns with those direct mail pieces. I know dentists, for example, it takes on average four postcards for them to get a client. Dentists are actually have one of the highest returns for direct mail pieces in any industry. Dentist and surprisingly uh, plastic surgery. Wow. So. It does it matter the location with plastic surgery? I mean, I haven't done national direct. I would just campaigns. imagine somewhere like Orange County and like Beverly Probably. Hills would have a higher response rate than like possibly, yeah. You know, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Maybe yeah. Who knows? I'm not a plastic surgeon. There's one other thing too, direct mail. That's, and you should see on the screen right now the shot of some of these sample letters. So, you know, you got the handwritten letter that is actually written by a machine and it looks like a ballpoint pen. It's super attractive and all that's good, but what's really important is get them to open it, just like Chris was saying. So what do you do to get them to open it? Well, there are companies that will fulfill direct mail for you and make something really special, put a sticker on it or something like that. But what we did is I actually had when my niece was really young, I had her just doodle on all of the envelopes. We're nice. talking about a thousand envelopes. Nice. She loved art. She's like 18 now. She probably doesn't really like art as much. <laughs> but I had her do that and she had fun and it got a higher response rate than any other campaign I ever had. Nice. So you probably just saw that on the screen right now or it's still on the screen little doodles, flowers, and stuff like that. So, yeah, absolutely. Little tips and tricks. Yeah, and I think really the thing with that is it, it's more personalized. There's something to be said about a small local, you know, mom and pop shop. And that's kind of the feel that that creates. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that only like to buy local, sell local, and do things with local people. That's strangers, not local. As opposed to if you're a real estate investor that has a national brand, hey, like more power to you, that's awesome, right? But if you're marketing as like, hey, we are ABC hedge fund, right? <laughs> like the little mom and pop who are, you know, facing foreclosure, who are in a really tough financial position, you know, and here you are marketing yourself as this big hedge fund, right? Like to some people, you are the 1%, right? Like, and that's like, there's a disconnect there, right? Like they can't necessarily relate with you, right? right? Whereas that letter that comes with, you know, a little doodle, you know, they probably have a child or a grandchild themselves, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it's relatable for them, right? And so now you're more human as opposed to this big robotic corporation. And I say all that to say, depending on what type of list you're marketing to, you might wanna have a different approach with your direct mail campaigns. Yeah, curiosity is the name of the game to get them to actually open it. And then it's like, you better bring it with the content. But a perforated check? is like number one exactly i get i open them all the time oh i every single time where if it remotely looks like it could be a check why because most of the time i know that it's probably going to be a piece of advertising however there's been times where i've gotten class action settlement checks from different class action suits that i didn't even know i was a part of a class of people that was in a lawsuit against the company and you got your one dollar and 26 cents we got a dollar we got a dollar 
Yeah, generally but, speaking. Every, yeah. But I have gotten a couple hundred dollars on those yeah. before. So I will always open something that looks like a check. And my guess is most of your clients will also open it if totally. it looks like a check. So, totally. yeah. So the next one is kind of like a more honorable mention. It's not what you would expect on the list of paid ads, uh, paid forms of advertising. And that's bandit signs. Bandit signs can be higher on the expense side or really, really low on the expense side, right? It just depends on what you're doing with bandit signs. Dollar you, Tree. Dollar Tree, yeah, exactly. I mean, you can literally go and get blank bandit signs that have nothing on them, right? And that's probably gonna be the lowest cost to enter that space because literally it's just the sign itself. There's no you know, printing or typography that needs to be on the sign. And so you're gonna go and you're gonna manually write on there and you know that's going to have an appeal to a certain type of person right you know and then you have the more fancy ones where it's like fully printed we buy houses we buy ugly houses we you know we buy crappy houses stop whatever it is we stop for closure right. yep or i buy houses right like uh, or jim buys houses right yep. you know some people have really good experience when they put their name and they humanize it right yep. going back to you know the little person versus the big hedge fund it's like you know do they want to sell to that person you know I mean, we've all heard stories of people that got multiple offers on properties and they chose to sell to a lower offer because they liked that family. It was like a married couple with kids and, and they wanted them to have the house, not this other you know business owner or whatever it was, right? Oh, so that can work in direct mail too if you have a picture of like your, your family and stuff like that. Yep. But cue the picture. What you're looking at right now is I think if this was the first banded sign of 2014, I hadn't taken pictures of the other ones, but what you're seeing there, what I did was a stencil. I cut out a stencil and then I spray painted every single one of the blank ones to do this because I did try to write them with a Sharpie and then, you know, just like writing the letters yourself. I mean, it gets old, you get black or whatever color it is, yep. Sharpie all over you and that doesn't come out easily. Spray paint doesn't either. <laughs> so just be careful. But it works, it works. To get them done quickly for a lower cost, you still gotta pay for it. But to take it to the next level, because it can work in some municipalities, they are, they are completely against it. You can get fined. So what you should be doing is just note, the government likes to take, local governments like to take off the weekends. So you wanna either A, yourself, or B, hire someone else to do this on a specific route based off of data. And again, where you get the data, you, Privy is a, is a place, we, Actually, I have a couple of bonuses if you click a link in the description, if you use Privy or if you want to try it out. But you can look and map routes to where you'll put them and then you yourself on like a Friday afternoon after 5 p.m. put the signs up and then Sunday evening take them down. That gets old. If it is in a market that you're in right now where bandit signs are crushing it, is it worth it? Possibly. But what is more worth it to me and to Chris, I guarantee this, is hire somebody else to do it. Exactly. Craigslist, kids. advertise their Facebook jobs, just get somebody else in that seat to do it. And there's a lot of other tips and tricks you could talk about as far as how to hire and manage those people. We actually do have a how to hire and manage people, bandit signs, drivers, stuff like that. We cover that in a, uh, another video linked in the description to check that out later. But that's just one way in which you can like you're saying, instead of writing it, you can spray it on with a stencil or whatever. Yeah, and, just make sure yeah. if you're gonna do spray paint, make sure you're one, outside, because you don't wanna be huffing those fumes. <laughs> but two, also make sure if you are outside that you're aware of the wind conditions and if needed, tape off an area with like, you know, some sheeting or something like that so you're not getting the wind blowing the uh, the spray all over you or anything else that you don't want that. I did that it in the garage over. and I forgot to open the door. That explains a lot. It does. I know it I know it does. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well the next one is gonna be something, you know, more on the technology side. And so you know these next two actually are kind of similar in some ways. The first one is pay per click. Right. And so that's like your Google ads, your Google, your Yahoo, your Bing. So all of those places. Now, the reason I bring that up when, you know, when I was doing digital advertising, Yahoo and Bing were actually really good because the competition was substantially lower. Be 
because they get less traffic, you have less people that are actually paying to market there. They're, like there's a lot of people that what they'll do is they'll just simply pay for Google ads, right? Well, Google ads are gonna show up where? They're gonna show up on Google. So they're not gonna show up on Yahoo and Bing. No. Right, well, there is about, I think it's about 30%, or at least at the time, it was about 30 to 35% of people would search on sites like Yahoo and Bing. So it's the equivalent of basically pulling a list, skip tracing a list, and only calling mobile phones and not calling landlines, right? You're missing out on a significant portion mm -hmm. of that market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what most digital marketing advertise, uh, advertising agencies will do is they'll They'll take your budget and they'll spread it across Google, Yahoo, and Bing. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that. I'm just stating a fact that you want to make sure that you know where your ads are going and where they're not going and understanding the demographic. Typically, the demographic on Yahoo and Bing are usually going to be sometimes a little bit older, but sometimes more business savvy as well. So there's just differences, you know, between the different platforms and search engines. But Google ads, you know, these are really directly targeted ads. Right, so they're leveraging all types of technology, tracking, cookies, all these different things to figure out who to serve that ad up to, right? If you are a person that they have determined would fit that criteria, right? So you, you've crafted your avatar, so to speak, of who you're trying to reach. Based on all of this evidence and data that they're aggregating, they determine, okay, you are a person that fits that and they're going to serve that ad up. Now, the cool thing is it's pay per click, right? So every click you're paying for that. Now it's generally not super ridiculously expensive, but it adds up, right? So impressions are how many people have viewed the ad, right? So if, I, if an ad gets served up to me and I look at it, right? I just look at it. I don't click on it. That's an impression. The moment I click on it, now all of a sudden it charged the bank account or, or the credit account on the Google AdWords account for that particular click within a 24 hour period. So if I click that 10 times in 24 hours, it's not gonna charge the person right. 10 times. Now the cost per lead on those types of ads can be a little costly. Uh, it can get up to you know 150 to $200, maybe $300 depending on the market that you're in. It can get extremely competitive and you want to set aside a budget. First off, if you're considering doing it yourself, make sure you know what you're doing because there is a, a lot of management that is involved. There's a lot of split testing, testing and measuring and understanding the results. But generally speaking, if you don't know that world, you're going to want to outsource that to somebody mm -hmm. that knows what they're doing. And what you can typically expect is you'll have a management fee and then you'll have an ad spend budget. And the ad spend budget is just that. It literally only goes to the ad spend. So for example, you could have have a thousand dollar management fee and then you could have a thousand dollar ad spend well when it comes to google right let's just say it's you know a hundred dollars per click and it probably isn't uh, but let's just say it's a hundred dollars per click and you have a thousand dollar ad spend and a thousand dollar management fee how many clicks does that get you 10, right? That management fee is simply to pay for the team that is managing your ads. So just be aware of that. One way or the other, you're paying for that, right? Whether you're hiring somebody and outsourcing it or whether you're doing it internally and you're taking your own time, you know, how much is your time worth? That's what you have to really figure out and how experienced in that space are you? But they're great, they're great leads. You know, they're people that are coming to you, they're inbound leads. So it's not convincing them to sell, it's people that are already considering selling. Mm -hmm. Now, generally speaking, you will get a contingent of people that click through that maybe they've listed their property on the MLS and you know they're just trying to see hey maybe somebody here might be interested in buying my house you could get wholesalers that are clicking those ads that are trying to sell their their deals to you you could even get your competition clicking on ads just to ha ha ha, ha that I'm definitely happens yeah. charge him you know but it's not as as rampant of a problem as as people might think you know and they do a pretty good job of like figuring that out so yeah i would say you know you'll get a, a fairly higher cost per lead but the quality lead can be substantially higher so one way in which to to get a lower cost per lead with ppc and we've talked about this too since we invest nationally ourselves not just having 
clients nationally to fulfill marketing for them is to do with PPC on a broader scale. So it has actually, it's gonna require more of a budget, obviously, but the way in which we'll approach PPC is to do it in multiple markets and that gives us at the end of the day, a lower cost per lead. Yeah, I mean, you have levels, right? So, you know, if you're only doing deals in Jacksonville, Florida, you're probably not gonna wanna do a larger reach to like the entire state of Florida, right? Um, if you're doing deals only in the state of Florida, you probably don't wanna do PPC that runs the entire southeast corner of the country, right? So it's all dependent on your business. If you're in a position to take on leads in a broader area, then you should certainly consider expanding that PPC ad to that broader area because it is going to drive the cost per lead down substantially. I mean, we've done different things in Florida, more so in the Facebook space, but it's the same process essentially just with some subtle nuance differences pay-per-click is great could work really really well and i would highly encourage you to, to to try it if you haven't already i would say it's just above entry level too so it's not something yeah. that when chris was talking about tv ads and radio ads it's not something that is just about brand awareness although yep. it is partly about brand awareness too because as you continue to search even those impressions Right when you see those impressions, you as say I want to sell my house uh, locally, you'll see the name, which is another reason why you want to hire a company to do this for you if you just really have no idea because they will know what phrases to use, yeah, what keyword research to to get so that you're paying the least amount as possible, but you have the most eyes and most impressions. Yep. And it's great because you do not pay for impressions. Yeah. But and what call also. to action is, is right. appropriate for what you're looking yep. for. And also like researching your competition. If you have no experience with pay-per-click, you might not realize that you can literally find every single one of your competitors that is using pay-per-click and you can see the statistics on what their ads are doing and how those ads are mm -hmm. performing. And so, you know, that's like... Pro tip yeah that's a pro tip to basically jump to the front of the line it's like do you want to do you want to stand in the long snaky line you know disney world or do you want to get the fast pass and jump to the front of the line so you can no skip everybody else right you know perfect example of that is mcdonald's and burger king right mcdonald's spends a million dollars per location just to research where the location should should go does burger king do the same thing you tell me no they don't they just put a burger king right around the corner or right across the street from mcdonald's they're the king of burgers so why spend a million dollars if mcdonald's is going to do it for you exactly same things with walmart yep and well walmart's the one spending the money doing the research you know and, and as a real estate investor researching your market which we have a link in the description a little bit more depth about that so i'm not going to belabor that research point for your market but following trends of big business and industry those are really great ways to research your market to determine where you should go in the same way researching your competition in terms of ppc and really any of these marketing methods uh, is absolutely paramount to the success of that marketing campaign yep yeah now the next one we're going to talk about is very similar to pay-per-click it's facebook ads so in its own way it is pay-per-click it's pay-per-click through facebook um, so there's a lot of similarities and crossover uh, one of the key differences though is facebook has a lot more rules and regulations re uh, regarding like targeting specific demographics you know you have very pretty heavy limitations on what you can target. So you're kind of a little bit broader in the approach. I would say, you know, from a from an accuracy standpoint to hit the avatar you're looking for, pay-per-click is gonna be way more accurate, but Facebook ads are probably gonna be substantially lower as a cost per lead standpoint. Now with Facebook ads, one of the differences between Facebook ads and pay-per-click ads is you can leverage images in those ads on Facebook, whereas pay-per-click, you're generally not getting that right. ability. You can't do that. The other thing that is different with Facebook ads is you can actually get engagement on your ads. You can get likes, you can right. get comments, things like that. So if one person sees it and they think of somebody that might benefit from that ad, they, can, they can tag them yeah. in that. So that's a little nuanced difference there. 
the other big thing that I was going to mention um, regarding Facebook ads is well as you know the com the comparison between Facebook and pay per click. Pay per click again is going to be a little bit more laser focused. And I mentioned that you'll get some wholesalers that are clicking those pay-per-click ads, but you have a higher likelihood of getting wholesalers clicking on your Facebook ads than pay-per-click, mainly because most wholesalers, what they're doing to find buyers is going into a lot of Facebook groups. So ostensibly they're spending more time on Facebook trying to engage with buyers for the properties that they have. And so they're going to have a higher likelihood of seeing your ad and thus clicking on it. And then, which may or may not be a good thing. If you're another wholesaler using Facebook ads, then maybe you don't want wholesalers contacting you, especially when most of them don't know their numbers, but you can always possibly take that wholesalers deal and daisy chain it to another buyer that you know and JV with them sometimes. Uh, or if you're an end buyer or you're, you're looking for fix and flips or rentals, maybe you want them bringing you their wholesale deals, yeah. right? That are off market. So it just depends on your market. The other big thing is testing and measuring the same way with like Google ads. You know, you really do want to spend some time testing and measuring, making sure that everything is dialed in and you have that process ironed out. You want to make sure that you are researching your competition, seeing what ads and campaigns work and seeing which ones don't. Typically we run three different Facebook campaigns at a time. And what that typically results in is two of those campaigns will usually be performing really well. And one of them will be performing poorly. And so then we'll kill that campaign and we'll create a new third campaign and then again keep going and then at some point one of those three will end up you know crap in the bed and then we'll kill that one roll in a new one so it just depends on what you're doing in florida we started out targeting the major metro areas like jacksonville tampa and orlando and we had about a 70 dollar cost per lead we ended up shifting strategies to go to the entire state of florida and that brought our cost per lead down below 30 dollar cost per lead which is beneficial However, one thing to consider, and depending on the markets that you're in and you know what the, the current market uh, is right now, which right now we're going into a downward market, we were starting to get a lot more deals in more rural areas, you know, not these major metro areas. Now, when the market's doing great, that's awesome because there's buyers there readily available. Right now, as the market is shifting, we're seeing a reduction in buyers, even in the major metros, and we're seeing an even larger reduction, not necessarily a larger reduction. There's not that many buyers in the rural areas anyway, but everybody is kind of holding tight. So it's going to be harder for you to monetize those more rural areas unless you already have a well-developed buyers list. So something to consider when you're thinking about making the switch from just major metros in your state to go in statewide, um, but it will reduce your cost per lead and possibly create some more opportunity for you. True. Yeah. And one thing about Facebook marketing that I personally like is the custom audiences. Mm. Custom audiences from an email list. And what we are going to talk about here in just a minute is something that is an even lower cost per lead. But what we want to do with the next two methods, including this method, is use the most of the data that we get. And we talked about this before, that it begins with a really good data set. And we talked about uh, where we get data from, and you mentioned a lot of good ones. Mm -hmm. And the next step to that is make the data even greater so you can actually utilize it at the highest yeah. level. And we'll be testing and measuring everything that we use in perpetuity but so far for the last several years what we've found to be the best place to skip trace is linked in the description you'll get fifty dollars off if, if this appeals to you and you sign up it's called best skip tracer they're really appropriately named john paul kildeff actually just texted me a while ago while we were talking because he's building out some custom stuff inside of best skip tracer right now they call it skippy 3.0 Yep. So really excited about that and what they have going on and what JP is the, the owner of Best Skip Tracer, also a friend and an investor uh, in our community as well, that we're, we're always going to go to them. So you should check them out if you haven't. We also have more content about that if you want to dive deeper into why we like it. 
but one thing to note so you said fifty dollars off just to clarify you get fifty percent off of whatever subscription level you get they have two different subscription levels they have a nine dollar a month and that gets you i believe it's 15 cents per skip trace and then they have a 99 dollar a month which gets you eight cents per skip right. trace so yeah. you're basically getting actually i think the first one might be 12 cents a skip trace but you're getting somewhere between four and eight or nine cents off by signing up for the $99 a month program, which if you skip trace, I think I calculated out if you skip trace more than like 24 or 2,500 records on a monthly basis, then that make the, the reduction in cost makes up for the $99 subscription. Ultimately, what I was gonna say is be that as it may, whatever skip tracing company you, you use, although of course we'd recommend best skip, best skip tracer when you get emails and phone numbers both cell phone and landlines make the most of it right and that's one of the reasons why we do facebook marketing is because of the email list and sure we could target those people individually if they have facebook accounts using their emails but facebook gives you the ability even though they change everything every maybe two weeks right i mean this might be completely irrelevant, you know, in a month they might change it, but assuming they don't, Facebook custom audience is, is huge because what is Facebook? What really is it? It's just data. It's a repository of data that they market certain products and services to those people and you put your information out there for free. Yep. And they'll use that to find people that are like the other person based on their email if they have an account, so you can market to them as well. Exactly. Right? If they fit in that profile, which also speaks to the necessity to, when you're pulling the data, get really good about stacking multiple levels of motivation and uh, get really targeted with your list that you pull. And of course we teach and train about this stuff. We do this for our clients. If you want more information about that, you wanna find out how we work together, link in the description below. You can get a free marketing strategy session yep. with our team. Absolutely. So. Cool. So the next ones are, you know, kind of complimentary. And so the first one is another tried and true uh, method, and that is cold calling. Um, now, there's a number of different ways that you can cold call. You can cold call yourself manually. You can outsource to a company that does cold calling on your behalf. You can actually leverage and hire your own VAs and then train them how to cold call. So there's a whole host of, of ways that you can do that, um, you know, but it's, it's a tried and true method. Basically, burn through a lot of phone numbers to, to get people on the phone but you know if you're doing it right you can generally see like two to three leads per day with a good set of cold callers mm -hmm. and, you know the great thing about cold callers as much as those are you know semi warm leads you know they're they're a little bit better than some other method just because of the fact that they have to sit there and stay on a call for you know 10 20 possibly 30 minutes for the cold caller to do the discovery and get all the information out of the uh, the seller you know ostensibly they'll be a, a relatively qualified um, seller so uh, it can be a great form of marketing for you so when it comes to cold calling picking up the phone and having conversations with potential sellers because remember you're targeting prospects they're not leads yet you're qualifying them to see if they're a lead. Chris and I and the rest of our team have done some really incredible trainings about it. As we continue to put that content out, it'll be available. It's its own playlist. It's linked in the description for cold calling. So you guys can check that out if you wanna see how to get better at cold calling. And of course, there's more resources available too. Yep. But yes, cold calling can be very, very profitable, but you gotta take action and get on the phone. And if it's not you, you gotta find somebody who's gonna be a good closer. Exactly. We use the setter closer model, which we also have training about as well, specifically geared to the setter closer model for this method of marketing. Exactly. Yeah. And the other thing too, is if you're layering this in with text message marketing, I mean, you can either call all of the phone numbers on your list, or you can just relegate your cold caller just simply to your landlines and just have them focus on that. So there's a couple different strategies you can take. And then of course you can layer in, you know, higher level strategies where you're saying, all right, I'm going to text everybody first. And then a week after I've texted everybody, then I'm going to start cold calling everybody. You know, maybe I'm doing extra layers of stacking, pulling out the people that have said yes, and I'm already talking to, and then stripping them out of the list. So there's a lot of different ways that you can layer that on using different tags systems the last one and you know what we view and our clients view as the best cost per lead overall with a high level of performance 
is SMS marketing. So text message marketing. There's a lot of people out there that are like, oh, text message marketing, it's dying, it's it's changing too rapidly, you can't make as much money. And while that may be true that it is not as profitable for some people as it used to be a few years ago, it is still a great method of marketing where you can generate a lot of leads and do a lot of deals. I mean, you know, for a couple of years, we were doing all of our deals just from text message marketing alone. Yeah. The great thing about text message marketing is, you know, you're you literally leveraging a device that is for the most part attached at people's hip, if not their wrist, which, you know, for any of you know who our relationship, this is a big improvement for our level of communication because now I don't he's got like his, being on the phone, okay? Yeah. Now, but he's now got the phone. phone's on me. Exactly. So, you know, like 98% of people that get a text message respond within the first three minutes, get a high level of interaction um, and it's quick interaction. You can weed through, you know, bad prospects and good prospects really, really quickly. There's a bunch of different platforms out there for text message marketing. And, you know, there's really two different types of text message marketing platforms. You have your, your spray and pray method, which is mass text, you know, it's one click and it'll blast out, you know, a thousand messages or whatever it is. That method you should not be using, it's dying, it's killing the industry, it's creating all of the problems that we're seeing in the text messaging space right now because they're basically spam blasting everybody. Yep. Then you've got the other one, which is 10 DLC compliant, and that is one click, to send one message. Now that might seem very uh, labor intensive right? and cumbersome. However, you know, what we do is we just train our VAs to literally get, get all the templates set up, you know, have it ready to go and literally just rapid fire, you know, as quickly as you can tap the mouse button, that's as quickly as you can send each of those text He's messages He's really good out. at jujitsu, but he also has training courses about how to leverage your wrist control. Just Yep. So, you know, check, exactly. Check those out. Link in one the of the one of the things <laughs> one of the things that that we would encourage you to implement in your interview process and hiring process <laughs> is under additional skills, mention Morse code. If you have experience with Morse code, you could probably you send go. out a lot of text messages really quickly. No, I wouldn't suggest that. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a great form of marketing. You know, we're sending out, you know, in the first six months of this year, we sent out about two million text messages across multiple markets uh, and we've delivered over 5,000 leads say the name say the number again two million two million and yeah. delivered 5,000 leads. that's a lot yeah, yeah. that's exactly. a lot exactly people who use it at a high level are saying that's a lot yeah exactly and the interesting thing is there's a lot of different platforms so you know again get rid of the spray and pray mass text method, focus on the 10 DLC compliant. And within that umbrella, you have a handful of different platforms out there. You've got REI Reply, you've got Roar, I guess is still around. You've got maybe Lead Sherpa still doing it. You've got Batch Leads, um, and then you've got Launch Control. And there's also Smarter Contacts. So there's a bunch of different platforms out there. You know, the key thing that when we're looking at things, we've been using launch control for the last three years and we've checked out pretty much every other platform out there. And everyone that you just mentioned and beyond. Yeah. And you know, we hear from people from time to time, like, Oh, I use this because it's cheaper. I use that because it's cheaper. The analogy that I give is let's say you had Chris and Christian and we were in a race to get from California to Pennsylvania right and we had to drive across the country he'd win because i don't want to go to pennsylvania <laughs> he doesn't want to leave his house go ahead, go ahead. anyway uh so if we had a race to get from california to pennsylvania or anywhere on the east coast three thousand miles away right and we had to drive a vehicle there right and christian decides i'm gonna spend the next six months building a car and then i'm gonna get in that car and then i'm gonna drive across the country meanwhile me over here where I'm like, let's be fast and efficient. I'm just going to walk into the dealership, sign some paperwork, drive off the lot and start making my way across the country. Who do you think is going to get to the other side of the country first? I'm probably going to get there before he even finishes 
setting up his space to he start will. building his car. Except I'm going to get my man card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's basically the equivalent of a lot of these other platforms. It's because they you have to integrate a bunch of different things together to build it out and make them work together. And the challenge, oftentimes the challenge with that is when you have one system that's relying on another system and there's integrations, oftentimes those integrations can fail. You have to reintegrate things. And so there's challenges there, but most people that I've talked to when they're saying, oh, this is cheaper than launch control, they're not factoring in all of the things that they need to integrate. They're Twilio, they're Plivio, like all these different things that they have mm -hmm. to integrate to make it actually function. And when I actually went through and I did the cost analysis, it was like maybe a hundred or two hundred dollar a month difference, you know, but I can get up and running faster, more efficiently, and it's already tried and true and proven, and I've had great success with launch control. So why am I gonna make a switch to something that is a lot more labor intensive for me to, to build out and set up, and doesn't really have a significant selling point on you know performing at a higher level? You know, if it was like, okay, well, we're gonna get you, we're gonna get you double the responses. Well, absolutely, I would consider that all day. But when I've also talked to these other people about, hey, what's your average deliverability rate, your average response rate? And I found that for the most part, they all have a lower deliverability mm -hmm. rate. Uh, and so, you know, at the end of the day, right, like these little nuances matter. We did a, a, we did a competition with our, our ISAs, our VAs, um, regarding creating new templates for launch control. And so the way we did it was they had to create new templates that were able to be saved. And then we saved them into all of our clients' accounts. And then we did 30 days where all of the ISAs were using all of those specific templates. And the difference between the highest performing one and the lowest performing one was only a 2% difference uh, from, a deliver, or from a response rate standpoint um, or the number of leads generated, right? Um, and response rates. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but when we did the calculation over the course of an entire month, what it mm. ultimately means is that the one that performed 2% higher overall would actually get 1100 additional responses to that message mm. versus the person that was 2% lower. So you factor that over the course of a year. I mean, 10 months, that's 11,000. That's what another plus another 22. So that's like 130,000 additional responses on a yearly basis. Well, if all other things stayed true, you know, you would close multiple more deals throughout the year just simply based on that little nuance difference. So I, I say that story to tell you that, you know, I've talked to people that are using other things and they're like, oh, I have a 60% deliverability rate, a 70% deliverability rate. Well, we have a 90% average deliverability rate. Mm -hmm. That's substantial. So now out of 100 messages being sent, you have one person has, we'll call it 70 responses. I have 90 or 70 delivered. 90 delivered right then when you come to responses even if we have the same uh response rate let's say we both have 20 percent, right i'm gonna have 18 responses they're gonna have 14 responses and that's just out of 100 messages in our business we're sending out on average uh, about 2500 messages per day per market yeah, yeah. so you know you you calculate that out right so that's what was it four four um, response difference between those two numbers mm -hmm. you know you multiply that by 25 that's a hundred ad additional responses that we're getting yeah. just when you factor all those those um, those numbers into play so it is a massive difference. Um, we love launch control. Like I can't see us veering away from launch control. We tried they, to. Yeah. I've been looking for the past several months at something that's different. And I've realized breaking it into two different categories where I go into depth about this topic in a video. I will link that in the description below. And it's called, the video title is The Death of Launch Control or Is This the Death of Launch Control? It's definitely worth seeing so watch that if you're curious about it and i do mention an alternative only one other alternative that i would recommend but it's a very specific reason why you would want to go 
to that related to what he's talking about right now. So check that out. But you're right. I mean, this is like the number one marketing method for the lowest cost per lead. But what you're speaking to is two different things. The platform you use, but then how you use it. Yep. So you got to use it at a high level. Yeah. So how do you use it at a high level? Yeah, you got to have systems and processes in place. And so, you know, we've we've been leveraging the systems and processes that we've developed uh, for the last three years. Uh, and it's been successful for all of our clients nationwide. And so if you're looking for a way to systematize your launch control um, usage, I would encourage you to click the link below, get on our calendar for a marketing strategy session. If you're not using launch control at all, right, then we'll actually go through and show you how to use launch control at a high level and we'll get you some additional bonuses for signing up. If you are already using launch control, we'll actually do an audit of your system and show you where your shortcomings might be and show you what you're doing really well and showing what you might uh, need some improvement on. Uh, and then for those of you who, you know, either A, you just have some extra uh, funds available to deploy into marketing or, you know, B, you're just tired of managing the marketing yourself and you want to outsource that we have a done for you marketing package as well with a few different tier options where we can actually take over your text message marketing and cold call marketing uh, and handle all of that for you and I say that it's not just the actual marketing right there's additional levels in that because what we do is we help you figure out what the list is that you want to go for we'll pull the list we'll skip trace the list we'll scrub the list prior to skip tracing to make sure we're not paying to skip trace numbers that you've already paid for um, which by the way skippy 3.0 is going to have uh, an additional feature mm -hmm. where it's actually going to uh, cross-reference previous lists that you've skipped traced to remove duplicates. So that's something that's really, really valuable and will save you a lot of money I'm in so the long run. I'm so excited for that. Oh, I can't wait for that. Because we have a process right now that we utilize to, to fix that, to solve for that. And investors that we work with, their minds are blown. They're like, wait, I'm still, I can save, depending on their volume, right? Thousands of dollars a month without uh, skipping duplicates? Yes, you can. But for us, when we take it over, it's a lot more labor intensive. Yep. So we talked to JP, best skip tracer, and he's like, yep, let's fix that. Exactly. So he's fixing it. So, exciting. but yeah, anyway, back to the marketing that we do, um, you know, we'll take all of that over. We'll skip trace it, scrub it, sift through, and then we'll do all of the text message marketing for you all the way through to the point where it makes sense as a lead. And then we'll deliver that right to your CRM. So you can hop on the phone with them right away and get those deals locked up. So if you want to learn more about that, click the link below in the description and schedule your free strategy session. And we'll walk you through our process and if it makes sense for you to sign up for our marketing we'll discuss that see if we're a good fit to work together otherwise if you still want to do the diy process uh, we'll show you all of our processes and uh, hand that stuff off to you um, so you can do it at a higher level yeah we'll hook them up man absolutely and you know as one as might we... say we'll make it easy i think that's uh, appropriate yeah I will say as we kind of wrap up this whole like paid methods of marketing, the top 10, that's, that's the top 10. The, the truth is you got to do what works for you in your market from market to market. We talked about it being local real estate is local. So test track measure. And it's super important to establish your KPIs and track your KPIs. So one thing you didn't mention about the marketing launch strategy session and what we do when we consult those who are interested in stepping their game up in marketing is we provide our custom KPI tracker that we spent like 2,500 bucks on. And, and, and that's okay. Sure. You could get that. We've closed a lot of deals, but the truth is we're, we're giving it away because you're not going to know where you need to change or pivot if you don't track your KPIs. So that's something that we definitely encourage you to do if you're not doing it. And surprisingly, a lot of seasoned investors are not doing that, but they're stepping over uh, pennies to pick up, or sorry, stepping over dollars to pick up pennies when they're oh, not yeah. tracking. 
Yep. So. Yeah, actually, that's a great point. I mean, I was just at the Sub2 Mastermind uh, this past weekend with Pace Morby and a bunch of real high-level investors there. And uh, one of the investors there uh, is doing about 25 to 30 deals every single month, uh, primarily in pre-foreclosure deals. And, you know, I started asking him about, you know, his statistics, KPIs for his text message marketing, because that's what he's doing a lot of. And, you know, there were a couple key things that he, he didn't even know. And, you know, that's not a knock on him it's just he didn't have a process to track those things and so you know what you pay attention to and and what you, what matters to you as far as statistics and KPIs is what you're going to leverage to influence mm. your business moving forward right and um, as I was talking to him you know he was having like a 60% deliverability rate and didn't he he didn't even have a method to track his response rate and that that was the key thing um, so basically every response what you know so he didn't he just didn't know what like a qualified lead was versus an unqualified lead in the response category so um but he's you know i mean i he's doing really well I mean, right you can make a lot of money deals. doing things like inefficiently yeah exactly but think about how much more you'll make and more opportunities you'll create if you're doing things efficiently exactly i say all that to say it's like it's like a gps right like you know you can either just drive aimlessly and hope you get to a destination or you can use a gps and if you go off course what is the gps going to tell you to do it's going to say make a u-turn mm -hmm. get back on track right well, if you don't track and measure these different KPIs, you're not gonna have something to tell you like, hey, you, you're off track and you need to get back on track. Or hey, you're on a really good track and a really good runway. So um, that's something that's really important. And so, yeah, definitely, um, you know, we'll share that KPI tracker with, with, you know, everybody out there. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, that was our video on the top 10 paid methods of marketing that you can leverage in your real estate investing business so that you can grow and scale your business. Now, in the next video that you're going to want to click to, which is right here, we're going to talk about now that you have those leads, what is the next step? So stay tuned click the like button, hit that notification bell. And if you're not subscribed, I don't know what you're waiting for because it's time to make it easy.